Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DMV Business Show. I'm your host, Odo Sevilla, and today we have a very special guest, Jordan Foley. Jordan is the CEO and founder of Chow. Welcome to the show, Jordan. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me on, Odo. This is great. I'm excited. I've been a fan for a while. Now I get to be on it. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So as I was mentioning offline before we hit record, I'd like to get the audience to get to know you a little bit as a person. Are you originally from the DMV area? I'm not. Um, actually, I'm from born and raised Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So, uh, you know, Steelers fan and everything. I know it's kind of enemy territory here with, with the Ravens. But uh, yeah, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. Same with my wife. And, you know, we've been together since high school. So we both moved around a lot with the military, uh, you know, been in for nine years now and lived in uh, seven locations. And, you know, my daughter's four years old and my other's one year old. My four year olds lived in four states already. So, you know, it's been it's been a lot of moving, but Pittsburgh's where I call home. Oh, wow. That is a lot of moving. Okay. So you, you, you're college sweethearts. You mentioned high school, you and your wife. I'm yeah, sorry, not college. I'm in high school sweethearts. Yeah, yeah. We're actually, uh, so I was, I was Naval Academy and there's this thing called the, the 2% club where only 2% of midshipmen who come in with a significant other leave with that significant other, you know, still in a relationship. And, you know, we, we dated in, uh, you know, we were in high school. We've been going to school since sixth grade together, but started dating in high school. Um, you know, her dad was my English teacher. You can imagine how fun that was uh, and, and everything. But, you know, we have two great close-knit families and uh, stayed together the whole time and got married uh, when I was down in Charleston for nuclear power school, starting my submarine training. And, uh, you know, got two beautiful daughters now, but uh, she's been through it all. So military spouse related things. And, you know, that's, that's her. She's, uh, she's definitely been through it all and understands the challenges. Sure. Jordan, so how were you growing up in Pittsburgh? As a child, what were you into? Sports a lot. So, you know, I was baseball, basketball, football. You know, I, I, that's the, you know, the typical thing when you're, you're kind of a little outside. So we're in rural, rural Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania area. But, you know, the land of, of Joe Montana, Joe Namath, Dan Marino, you know, that's football. And, uh, you know, I was, I was a quarterback in high school too. And so like, I, I loved the game. I was a student of the game. I lived, breathed and sleep, you know, football. And that was kind of how I spent most of my time. But, uh, you know, I, I also had a passion, you know, I came from a big Italian family. Every Sunday was feeding 25 to 30 people. You know, all, all of us were in the same area. Like we didn't really leave Western PA from when we got there from a couple of generations ago. And, I just grew up cooking for a lot of people with my grandma, whether it was rolling dough for homemade pasta or, you know, just uh, helping set the table or doing whatever, peeling potatoes. Um, you know, that was kind of us. It was, it was a lot of work and sports through the week. And then Sunday was always the day all the Foley's got together, sat down around the table and, you know, the cousins played and we were even playing sports on that day. We went outside and went play, but you know, that was the day we'd all get together and, and, you know, have a nice big family meal. So that was, times I'm thankful for, for growing up around such a big family. So I guess Sunday was football, Sunday mass, and then uh, food. <laughs> yeah, which is, I, I feel like this is like a Pennsylvania cliche at this point, but yeah, like that's, uh, that's absolutely accurate. It was, uh, you know, watching the Steelers, getting good food at grandma's and, uh, you know, also like, you know, Get, getting tackled by the cousins out front. I mean, we had like nine or 10 boys, I think, in the, in the family with a couple girls too. And they were playing football as well. And like, you know, it's just, look back on times like that. You don't, you, it's not like until right now when you're like, wow, I really cherish that. That was some, that was some of the best times of our lives then, you know? Yeah, they are. I, I remember even when you're me little, wanting to grow up fast so I can be an adult, but then now as an adult, and I tell my children, uh, I have three boys. I'm like, guys, just slow it down. Enjoy it. I'm telling you, there's there's a lot of more responsibilities. There's a lot of things in your planning in your mind once you become an adult. Oh, yeah. Adulthood is overrated. I'm telling my, my, my four-year-old girl and my one-year-old girl, I'm like, you know, stay little as long as you can because it's, I know I wanted to fly out of the house and go to college. And then I realized like, well, was the best time of my life was just being at home there with the family. <laughs> yeah. So you, you did high school all through, Pit you, you stayed in Pittsburgh, right? Yep. And yeah. then after that, would you, did you go to college or where? Yeah, I did. Um, so I was in seventh grade uh, when 9-11 happened. And I watched, that this was like wheelie TV times, right? So the TV was wheeled to each classroom as we changed periods. And I remember just watching this and processing it as a seventh grader. And I went home and my grandfather was, you know, enlisted in the Navy in World War II. And I kind of asked him, I was like, how 
how do I do something? How do I join the military? It just, you know, it wasn't, we were not a military family. So I asked him, like, how do I join the military? And he goes, well, from his experience, one of his officers went to the Naval Academy and he loved that. He was just his role model. And he said, well, if you want to be the best officer you can be and do the most good, go to an academy, go to the Naval Academy. And I said, all right, seventh grade on, um, that was my focus. So like, you know, sports, school, go to the Naval Academy. Like that was really it. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of why I didn't start dating my wife till like I was a senior, right? Like it was just no time for anything else. Um, but, you know, with that came some failure. Um, I didn't get into the Naval Academy out of, out of high school. So, you know, I was all right, like totally crushed. Um, and I went, I went to Division III's college, was playing football there. But I remember sitting at football camp, hot day in August in my dorm room after practice and clicked on my computer, reopened the application portal for the Naval Academy and was clicking apply again. And I did it. I finished it, applied again. And uh, the next time around, I, I got in and, uh, you know, became, you know, completed my dream of, of getting to the Naval Academy and starting my career as a Naval officer. So that was the, that was the progression um, of things. And, you know, that honestly, that, that put one of the biggest chips on my shoulder. I mean, not only just being like a five, nine quarterback in Western Pennsylvania, that's enough to put a chip on you, but um, you know, Hey, tell being told you aren't good enough. And then, you know, getting there, it really wanted me, it really made me want to say like, now it's time to prove myself and do this. And that was, you know, the next motivating factor in my life where I was, you know, told like, Hey, we don't think you can make it here. And I, I kind of said, let's see. And you said when you went the second time around, you were in a D3 school. So were you still in Pennsylvania attending that college? I actually went to enemy territory again at uh, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, uh, where, you know, the Browns fans are, but um, incredible school. Uh, you know, we, we had an undefeated season that year in Division Three football, um, got two rounds into the playoffs, too. Honestly, was very happy there. Um, but I, uh, you know, I guess, you know, me being, you know, so driven to go to the Naval Academy really did just say, I'm going to start this all over. I'm going to go back as a freshman because that's how you transfer. You don't, you don't start uh, as a freshman. So restarted everything at the Naval Academy. But um, yeah, I was in Cleveland for that year. And, um, you know, that was a fantastic year of my life. I always say when I went to, to, to real college for a year, uh, but, uh, you know, that was, it was, it was amazing. I still have friends um, from that, you know, one year being there too. So you, you finished the first year in Cleveland and then you transferred to the Naval Academy and you start off as a freshman. Oh yeah. Yep. You start off bottom, bottom of the barrel. There's no, nobody gets to jump anybody. So you're a plebe. That's what they, you know, they call you. You're the, you're the plebe. You go through plebe summer. It's the boot camp of the Naval Academy and uh, you eat, you eat humble pie every day. Uh, you know, you just, you just, you learn, you get indoctrinated um, and there's things you do and you're, you're told to do and forced to do that don't make sense until this is kind of like raising kids. Like, you know, you tell them to do these things and they don't know why, but then it'll eventually click. Naval Academy. It's like, Hey, you got to line up and shout every meal that's being, you know, provided today from every menu item down fast and succinctly to your, you know, boot camp instructors. And if you screw up, they're yelling at you again. It's like, why am I doing this? Why did I leave normal college to do this? And then you don't realize until seven years later when you're on a submarine and there's a crisis on the submarine, a maintenance failure, and you only have about 30 seconds to shout out two minutes worth of orders before you lose power. Um, then you realize like, wow, that wasn't a switch I could have turned on. This is why when you're calling in an airstrike or something, you finally realize like, no, there's, there's a reason for all of this. And, you know, you start to appreciate, um, you know, the, the things you went through whenever you were, you were at boot camp. But, um, you know, that's, that was it. And I um, honestly can't say I had a great time, but looking back on it, you know, proud, proud to have gone through it and happy to have gone through it. That's interesting you mentioned that, Jordan. It just brings back, I recently saw a movie, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, with Tom Hanks, Greyhound. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. they're shouting, they're in the submarine, and, and I'm like, oh, I just saw that. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's, um, that's actually a really good naval warfare movie. I, I, do, I do recommend that one. And, and Tom Hanks just, just pretty much being the most consistent actor. Uh, that that I can I can even you know, say for this generation, but uh, yeah, you're you know you're right. It's it's that is it's kinetic, it's fast paced, and um, those people were all trained in a relatively short period of time to go protect our country at the most important hour. And um, military training does have a lot of merit to it. And it, it <laughs> you know the, the haircuts and things might seem like a little bit uh, much, but uh, overall, um, you know, there's there's reasons for everything. And I always tell 
new plebes, you know, I'm now like in my thirties, you have 18 year olds coming in saying like, what's this, what's that? I was the king of my high school. Why am I doing this? And I tell them those stories. I say, listen, this is, you got to buy into it. And when you buy into it, um, good things will happen. You'll become a good Naval officer. And that's what you're here to do. So once you're there, you're in the Naval Academy, what's your thought or what, what's your goal as far as what to, after this, or what were you thinking? What are you thinking then? Yeah, my, I've stepped in. Um, there's this little book that we all get that has all these different memorization poems and songs and things that they'll just continually ask you about throughout the summer. I'd already memorized that because I was ready to go. So I was like, all right, I'm going to crush plebe summer. I'm going to be the best plebe, you know, here. And then after that, I was like, I'm graduating top of my class. Like, those are my goals. I'm going to work. I'm going to work and study hard enough to graduate top of my class. And I'm going to physically work hard enough where any job that comes out there that I'll be able to get. So service selection is a whole thing. Like you put in your preferences in the community, pilot, submarines, surface warfare, SEALs, they select you. So my goal is to say, I want to be able to choose from anything at the end of the day. And I want to be top of my class. And that was the first day I stepped in, got my head buzzed. Four years later, you know, there I was. Top of your class? I was. Yep. First overall for more military order of merit. And uh, got selected to actually go to graduate school at MIT for two years after that. These are not places that Foley's know, right? Like this is, you're talking like Western Pennsylvania, Steel Town, like actual mill workers in my family with my grandparents. MIT was not a place that our family even considered. It was almost mythical, right? And here I am saying just like a normal person with a chip, um, I'm going to study sun up to sundown on the weekends, do all this and push myself um, because, hey, why not, I guess, but also is like, I just got into this rhythm of trying to prove everybody wrong. You know, like I said, being a 5'9 quarterback, you're too short to play in Western Pennsylvania. Three years of being a starter in high school level, okay, you know, you're not good enough to come to Naval Academy. Oh, really? And I think that chip you see drives a lot of athletes, like your Aaron Rodgers and your Tom Brady's, of course, but um, I think at a personal level, it does wear on you a bit. And it started to wear on me for a while after of like, how much energy can I put into constantly proving people wrong and being this Western Pennsylvania kid with a chip. And, uh, you know, you do start to see it deteriorate who you are and, and you don't want that to affect you. But when that becomes part of your personality, you know, you need to, you need to really step back and say, hey, when is the time going to be where I stop trying to prove everybody wrong and start trying to prove people who love and believe in me right? And that was a transition point for me after the Naval Academy of saying, I, I can do this and people believe in me. When did, when did you decide, Jordan, to go MIT? That was, um, honestly, that came upon me at the Academy. So like when you have a 4.0 uh, at a certain point, they come to you and say, would you like to apply for a Rhodes Scholarship? You know, a very prestigious international scholarship at Oxford. And it helps because service academies can send midshipmen and cadets there and it's great PR. So they, they kind of help, they groom you in these programs. So I didn't meet the roads requirements. I didn't really get to the final interview, but because I graduated at a certain part of my class and I also got a full ride, um, the Navy allows about 10 people from the Naval Academy every year to go pursue graduate education. And while I was going through this program, I said, let me put my name in the hat at MIT and a couple other schools and MIT gave me a full ride. And I was like, well, I, I kind of want to get to the fleet, but I also can't turn this down. So I went there. Uh, I had service selected submarines. I was ready to go, but I, I took a two year you know, diversion to go to MIT and uh, work at one of the laboratory, one of the Department of Defense laboratories there and uh, actually formed another whole part of my personality and relationship with the DOD and, and business uh, through that of being in a staff role. Uh, right away. So that was, uh, you know, something I would have never thought was an opportunity. And I don't think many people do know it is. But another thing is, when you, when you work hard, sometimes opportunities present themselves. And, and it did. So when you're at MIT, as far as graduate school, what were you thinking? What were you studying there? I was studying technology policy, and I got a second master's in, in political science, too. Um, that kind of came from a, a funny story, like, I was used to having like an academic advisor telling me what the schedule and like scheduling like classes from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day, like the Naval Academy. So my first year in grad school, like I did that. And at the end of the year, they're like, well, you've, you've completed this whole degree. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, I mean, can I take extra classes now? I'm like, 
yeah, you're, you're fully funded for another year. Do you want another graduate degree? And I was like, yeah, I mean, definitely. And I, you know, I love working at this lab. This has been great. So I ended up getting two degrees and in, in areas that I've, I've always found, you know, re really interesting in, in political science and technology and the intersection of policy. And a lot of that came with, with business school type classes too over at Sloan. Um, and, and it just kind of set me off early on, on seeing about the interconnectivity of, of politics, private sector, and all these things. And I, I think it uh, really opened my eyes to, to how work is done, especially in a DOD context, but um, overall was, was a really great experience. And, you know, graduate school itself, um, you know, can, can be great when you put yourself, pour yourself into it. And I think I accidentally poured a little too much at the start, but, um, you know, just kind of used to being a midshipman on a midshipman schedule, I guess. Sure. No, you, you definitely advance much faster. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So after the two years at MIT, what happened to you? What, what was next? Next was a nuclear power school down in Charleston. So it's about a year long training program. And, and this is this is really interesting here is we they do say it's one of the hardest, um, you know, military academic trainings there are. And I, I mean, I agree. I, I struggled like it was hard. Um, is there a classroom portion? And then there is also this hands-on reactor portion. Um, every nuclear officer is trained on a real live reactor to understand how these things operate. Because you know, in the nuclear navy, there there are no accidents. Um, there can no, there cannot be accidents. So, when we started this training program in the 70s, um, there was a mandate that every submarine officer worked on a reactor, and we, you know, worked on a reactor at the Charleston uh, Naval Weapons Station there, a, a decommissioned submarine that still had an active core. And that was a whole year long training program. And um, that's where my wife and I got married and uh, loved loved the food scene, loved everything in Charleston, but was working some, some long hours, some long shifts even um, to complete that training. Wow, and you were there for about a year and a half, you said? Yeah, yeah, about a year and a half. Okay, and then afterwards, did you move elsewhere? We did. We went up to Groton, Connecticut for uh, what's called submarine officers basic course. And that is the tactical training side of things. So we were up in Groton, Connecticut, awaiting our duty station too. So that's when you get assigned to your first submarine, kind of waiting to see where we would go. We were actually hoping for Groton itself because we, we do like the East Coast. Um, Connecticut's familiar enough. Um, but, you know, after that, tra that tactical training period was done, we actually got stationed up at uh, Kittery, Maine in the shipyards um, up there. And um, if, you're, if you've seen Hunt for Red October, there's a, there's a great scene from, from that movie where they're actually in the shipyards and you can see the welding of the ship and everything. And that, that's where we were. Um, I met the USS Annapolis up there and uh, met some really great people and learned a ton about uh, the military, you know, military industry surrounding shipyard maintenance. And, uh, you know, as a as a product, you know, we, we bought a house up in Portland, Maine there, and uh, we still have it. And that's honestly the best place we have lived uh, to date. We love it. Uh, and we're, we're hopefully going to retire there too. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I, I've heard great things about Maine. I've never been up there myself. Oh, yeah. Um, not only that, like a lot of great programs for employment too. Um, they have something called Boots to Roots that helps veterans go up and find uh, jobs in Maine. Um, but, you know, if, if you're talking about like the most temperate, beautiful summers you've ever had, that's Maine. And then if you're talking about like, if you don't mind snow, like I guess Maryland, I'm not gonna knock Maryland, but like when an inch falls on the ground, it kind of shuts some things down. There were days in Maine, there were four feet and the roads were clawed before I went to work at 5 a.m. And it's like, wow, this is, they just, they know it, they know it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an out, outdoorsy person too. And uh, I, I did, I did love Maine and I, I highly recommend Portland itself for, for the food scene and, you know, just generally the, the lifestyle. So the summers in Maine, Jordan, what's the average temperature? Is it sometimes like here 80, 90 and very humid or? Yeah, no, no humidity. It'll get up there like your 80s. But, um, you know, the main beaches, like, you know, those are those are some rocky, some sand, but like, you know, you, you can sunbathe. It's, it's, you know, it's not it's not cold. Like, you know, you'll get your days, your 70s. But like, when, it, when you step out, you don't get that humidity like around here, which um, to me, like, you know, coming from Western Pennsylvania, where there wasn't a lot of humidity, then going to the Naval Academy in the summer, for boot camp, where you're running all of the time, like, I think I started sweating on like, June 30th and didn't stop sweating until like I graduated. <laughs> like, <it's> just... <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So in the end, how'd you end up here in the DC metro area? 
Yeah, I, um, so the submarine took us a lot of different places. We went back to Groton and then we changed home port to San Diego. Uh, and while we were in San Diego, I applied for what's called the Law Education Program. Um, it's, it's a program in all of the services that allow line officers from any community to transfer to the JAG Corps. So become a judge advocate, become a lawyer in, in the service. So I, I applied and got accepted um, for the Navy's JAG program. And at the same time, you're supposed to be applying to law schools. And I got into Georgetown and um, wanted to, to go to Georgetown for, because of their national security law, because of their resources. So we um, went up and came, you know, moved to DC, but um, you know, in the meantime, I'm, I'm deploying, I'm out in the submarine and my wife is looking for a house for us to live. And she loves Annapolis because of, you know, obviously we, we dated the Academy. She has really good memories of it. Um, I told her, I was like, just draw a 45 minute radius around DC anywhere's fine. And, you know, here's our budget. And I, you know, come up and she goes, all right, Hey, we bought a house in Annapolis. Cause you know, she has power of attorney. She can do it all. And I was like, when did you GPS this 45 minutes? <laughs> like, was it at 3 a.m.? Because that's, but uh, end up getting a really great home out here in Annapolis. So we, we reside out here. Um, my daughters have you know, eight kids in the neighborhood they play with within their age group and uh, very happy to be out this way. But yeah, what brought me to DC and us to DC was, was law school, which I'm finishing up uh, a, a week today, uh, actually, is my graduation. And then I, you know, head back to, to that travel cycle we talked about. So three years for law school in DC has been the longest we've been anywhere, but um, you know, we're, we'll be here hopefully for another two years uh, getting stationed in DC when I uh, cut my teeth as a Navy attorney. Okay. So you're staying here in this area then after, okay. Yeah. That was yeah. going to be my next question. Where are you heading to next? Yeah. DC hopefully for two years. And then we're going to, we're going to see where the Navy takes us. Uh, you know, it was, it was one of those things we asked for Connecticut and they gave us Maine and we were like, well, and it ended up being, you know, one of the greatest things we've ever, you know, we love Maine. Right. But um, we're, we're kind of along for the ride in some ways, but uh, it's, it's uh, sometimes you, you, you don't know what's, what's best for you, I guess, as my mom would, would always kind of say to me. So, you know, if, if they, they take us to Germany or a road to Spain and uh, or Japan, uh, it can be, unique experience for the family but right now we're in the dc area for the time being that's great so uh, how, how did chow come about yeah it was um you know it, it i i it, we incorporated in january 2020 but i like to think it was longer in the making i just didn't know what chow was at the time so we talked about how much i moved and that always wore on me because i would want to go coach football but then sometimes we were only there for like a year and at some point you don't even hang pictures on the wall or unpack boxes. You're like, we're going to be leaving soon anyway. So you obviously getting involved in the community is kind of a low priority then, which I don't like, I didn't like that at all. Um, so I wanted to start getting involved more in the community. So I thought I should really start my own nonprofit, but who do I want to help? What am I passionate about? Um, and then comes, you know, just working in the Navy, the culinary specialists and the great cooks that come on a submarine, like, you know, you got to make all fresh bread down there. You, you don't, you don't store bread. You, you bake it from scratch every time. So it's like, you have some of the best cooks you've ever met on a submarine. And it's like, well, you know, where are these fellows transition into next? Like they, they should be at a restaurant. They could be a James Beard award winner for all I know. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're talented, but you know, nothing was really out there, but I, I always kind of wanted to mix my love of cooking with, and passion for sailors and veterans and military spouses was some type of nonprofit idea. But the, the catalytic event for me was in 2019 when my, my Naval Academy classmate um, was starting his own businesses, um, he, he ran into some debt and ended up dying by suicide. And, and as a friend, like you, you feel guilty because they didn't come to you. Um, but also as like at the time I was a law student, you, you want to research what's out there. And I, I looked and there's some really great programs for veterans and there's others that are a mile wide and an inch deep. And um, I didn't think there were enough programs helping people deeply enough. So I married the love of helping veterans and military spouses with the love of cooking into chow, which saying, we're going to start you at any level. Uh, if you've never cooked before, we have online training uh, and we're going to take you all the way through setting you up for food truck ownership. So to become a culinary entrepreneur um, and we, are doing this all through our food truck training program and really at uh, January 2020 happens and then obviously COVID in March 2020 you know so our incorporated COVID and we, we had to pivot and figure out you know hey I, I like to think we were some of the first you know doing QR codes for menus when we were doing our pop-up stands and we raised enough money for a food truck and 
now we have four people in the system training to become business owners. And every time I step into a room to tell the story, um, people are like, wow, that's, that is incredible. We love what you're doing. And, and I mentioned, Hey, Oh, by the way, our byproduct, our positive byproduct is meals for the community. So in all of this is we're training to make two, 300 meals out of a food truck that we're giving to people in need and helping the community at the same time, which has been the most attractive feature for veterans and military spouses, just because like me and you know them services in their DNA. And that's, you can't detach that from their training curriculum with Chow. And we're just, uh, just getting started, as I like to say, a year and a half in the making. That's great. So right now, Jordan, you have four people, and these are current, are these veterans or they're currently enlisted or spouses? We have three military spouses and one uh, veteran who was enlisted. Um, and they're all, they're all women. They're four women of color and they're all working moms. And we have um, one woman who was born and raised in Baghdad, Iraq, and her husband was an army translator for 12 years before they were given citizenship in the United States. And she really wants to start a Middle Eastern food truck because she's a really great cook, like really, really great. And the regulatory environment is actually pretty complex around food trucks. So she's relying on us not only to gain the operational experience. I mean, the other day we tripped a breaker and I showed her how to fix it. We blew a fuse, I showed her how to do that, but also the legal side of things of like registering the food truck, she needs help with that. And guarantee in a year, she's gonna have the best Middle Eastern food truck in Anne Arundel County here. Um, and then there's uh, Marta, she's from Colombia. She's a military spouse and she just makes some of the best Colombian street food you've ever had. It's some cheese stuff, plantains, it's, it's pretty wild. And then um, Rosa and Sonia, Rosa's a military spouse, really, really great culinary mind, a great restaurant manager and wants to become one of the culinary instructors for Chow. And then Sonia, a baker, culinary student, army veteran, um, really passionate about comfort food and like, you know, all these people bring such life to Chow. Um, and this is just one cohort for the year. We plan to keep building people, adding food trucks and, and honestly producing one of the most vibrant food truck cultures uh, from this program. So. I, I love it, Jordan. So in just a short one to two year period, you've grown a great amount. How do you get the word out as far as to the community out there that this exists and where can they find all that information? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. And, you know, good question because we started out with just an idea and, and how do you pitch an idea? How do you sell an idea? And, and what we found is that we entered competitions. That's what we did. We found startup competitions and we just entered, 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 and we won and we kept winning. And when we wouldn't win all the way, we wouldn't go all the way to the finals, we would pitch. We would get emails from some judges saying, oh, hey, you know, I run this type of company. I really love what you're doing. Sometimes we, they would just donate straight to us. Sometimes they would direct us to grants and foundations. And as that competition momentum happened uh, and grew, we started to, to see success, but, but also like just by operating pop-up locations. So we would, we would do things, you know, during COVID, we started to see that it was difficult to source in a flexible market where we didn't really know how many customers we'd have because of over or under saturation based on a mobile market. So we started to see like we weren't sourcing food properly, but we also knew there were people in need. So what we did is we pivoted and said, all right, we're going to use this church kitchen or this American Legion kitchen and cook 300 meals to a community that needs it, use a third party nonprofit to help distribute. And then we'd go ask a business to say like, hey, like, would you mind supporting this? It's $500 for all the food. Would you do this? And they'd say, great. And we tag them on social media Then they'd repost it. And as we would do these things, we call it kitchen with a mission. As we'd keep doing these, we were increasing hours for veterans and we were increasing meals of the community. And then we were using, I guess, social media platforms for other larger companies in the area to get the word out about Chow. And it just grew and grew and grew until we raised enough money to then buy our own food truck. And now, you know, we're controlling operations out of that. That's great. Wow. <laughs> Jordan, so, you know, I know you said you're here in this area for the next, what, two years or so, right? Mm -hmm. After that, do you see chow in different areas or what happens? I do. I, I see chow as scalable and um, I like to tell people chow can be in your city as easy as one, two, three. And, and they say like, what, what does that mean actually? I'm like, well, we need one certified kitchen facility. So that's usually donated in kind um, through a church or a fraternal organization. So 
as a food truck, you actually need to hang your hat on a certified kitchen. It's called your depot. Uh, every county requires it. Most states require it too. Um, so that's one. Uh, and that, that's for my dry storage, my cold storage, my prep, everything. I need two full-time employees. So right now we have a hybrid functioning of that, but I, I need, you know, in a different city, I need an operations assistant, which is a combination of a lot of things. It's a grant writer, a recruiter, an application screener, a scheduler, um, doing a lot of the administrative stuff. And then I need a, called an executive director, but what it actually is is a culinary instructor combined with a restaurant manager who runs the trucks and runs the schoolhouse of the trucks. Then I need three vehicles. I, I need an 18 footer, which is what we have. Um, that's a lower capacity food truck that's nimble. It can actually go into many cities too. So some cities have feet capacity or feet you know, restrictions. An 18 footer can get into pretty much any, any city that, that, that does have a restriction. Then I need a 22 footer, which is your bigger box truck looking like FedEx vehicle. Um, those are higher capacity, producing way more meals than the 18 footer just based on the sheer space and size. And that's the second truck we need to complete the system. And then the third truck is a sprinter van. It's like a Ford Transit cargo. You see them catering vehicles all around. And with that, um, we, we say it's, it's about 175 to $200,000 all in. Um, and then Chow can have a permanent imprint in that city. And we believe with that system, we can help 30 veterans uh, maybe become business owners, maybe become sous chefs. It's up to them what they want to gain out of the program. But we set them up for that final stage of success um, in becoming a business owner because we partner with other nonprofits that offer free business classes for veterans and they get that financial training too while they're getting the hands-on vocational training from us. Um, so we think we can bring Chow to any city based on that model. It's just a matter of getting the funding, finding the right people, and then having the, the veterans and military spouses there to work and, and there to learn. And, and by the way, did I mention that, you know, we don't charge any of them tuition. This isn't a school in that sense. They actually get paid to be in the truck to sell to customers. Um, we fund this all through grants and donations, and that's how this is made possible, because that's how we believe vocational training should, should function. You should learn a skill while you're making money to then set you up for greater success. Okay. Uh, right now, currently, you only have the 18 player though, right? That's correct. Okay. What would you say drives you and motivates you today? Well, it started off with, you know, wanting to do more in the nonprofit space, helping veterans. Um, what now motivates me is, is just the human interaction every day. So seeing the four fellows, seeing what they're trying to achieve, whether it's a supplemental income for the family, um, whether it's, you know, working with, you know, the people in the community and supplementing food drives with hot uh, restaurant quality style meals, um, seeing the impact that a nonprofit food truck can have in the community on so many different social problems has really been driving me. And I think the pandemic has, has really shown, yeah, these food trucks can be fun and perky and come to your you and you can eat safely outside and do these things. But I think what's less publicized um, is that these food trucks can fight in food insecurity in a way that other things can't. Um, they can even bridge digital divides. Like our truck offers free Wi-Fi because we understand people don't have connectivity and we want them to be able to access things like healthcare, like being able to register for a vaccine on a mobile platform. So we're starting to see that these can do a lot more. And, um, you know, by the way, it's a different feel to go in a line and get a handout of a meal than it is for the food truck to come to you, you to order and you to get it. And you being in a tough spot shouldn't take away from an experience you can share with you and your kids um, because that's that's really what, what we're believing and, and what we see. So that's that drives me every day. It drives me to do this and you know work as hard as I do. And, and it drives the team too. Um, so I think that's that's what we've found is it's the human interaction. Jordan, I'm curious, you know, you're currently, you're about to be done with law school, you said, in next week, right? But during this time, you're a law, a full-time law school student, have a family, and have this almost brand new nonprofit organization. How do you balance all this? <laughs> yeah, it is, everybody, it, it is quite the juggling act, and I, and I, I do admit that, and, um, you know, as a, as a dad, sometimes you think like, you know, you're parenting, you're doing all these things. So like you sometimes feel like I'm not doing anything right. Like I, I'm doing everything subpar, but there's other times where it's like, you know, you, you make time for things that matter. And what's really shown me is as far as being a parent, 
being on a deployment cycle is important to understand how to most effectively spend time at home. So, you know, when you, when you, you don't leave for long periods of time, sometimes you can take for granted these moments. Like we mentioned those Sundays at my grandma's, like they were always around. So it was always going to be there. And now, now it's not like, you know, my grandma has long since passed and we don't have these events anymore. And you take those for granted. Well, being on deployments for eight months and then coming back home really makes you cherish the minutes with your children and really makes you spend, get the most out of that time. Uh, so that's, that's really one thing I've learned and how I like the function now. Obviously studying for the bar in law school is a full-time job in and of itself. Um, you know, I, I wake up early, like I did at the Naval Academy, 5 a.m. to start studying until the first kid, you know, gets, walks down or, or starts crying and I got to go pick her up. And then, you know, then it's a pause for a little bit. But, um, you know, behind all this is, is that great military spouse is my wife who's, who's running the whole thing and allowing me to do these and just being the support structure that, that this family needs. So um, do I not have any hobbies? Uh, well, no longer. Yes, I now have no hobbies. I used to golf all the time. Uh, I am now spending almost every waking moment I have in free moment with Chow, but um, it's, it's been well worth it for the reasons we talked about. The, the good thing, I'm sure, that the discipline and structure was taught to you early, especially at the Naval Academy or even prior to that, I'm not sure. But I'm sure that's come in handy now when dealing with all these different activities, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it was before the Naval Academy. I, I do like to say um, my, my, my mother ran a very tight ship at home. And I, I like to say um, both of her boys um, rebelled and went to service academies to kind of, you know, relax a little bit to get out, you know, to rebel, you know, to, to get away from so much structure at the house. So, uh, you know, my brother went to Merchant Marine Academy and I went to Naval Academy and, uh, you know, she, she raised two, you know, two boys who were definitely disciplined. And, you know, that's, I think that's really helped me throughout my life is, is kind of understanding how to manage time and um, do that. And I think it's, it's led to a lot of child success. And I think I've been a systems thinker uh, as long as I can remember. Submarines kind of helped with that too. But, um, you know, understanding how systems work and how time management works has, has been a way to maximize, you know, output. And, um, you know, I, I like to think that this is going to, you know, carry on, you know, through my naval career as I, as I, you know, go into my next phase as an attorney. Um, and I think this all started very early at home. Sure. sure. You just mentioned now, as far as your next phase as an attorney, what, what are you thinking as far as what, what law or what specialty to go into? Yeah. I mean, um, people ask kind of why, like, you know, why did I go get the JD? And, and I, I noticed it back when I was at MIT and I noticed it in other staff role, staff roles, but in the decision-making rooms surrounding national security events and decision-making, um, the youngest people in the room always had JDs. Um, so like, you know, if you wanted, you know, you could get your PhDs and be the experts in that field, but it seemed to be that the, the youngest people were always lawyers. Um, so I thought, you know, I, I wanna be in these rooms for a career. I enjoy national security um, as, a, as a career focus. So the next step logically to me would be to become, you know, get, become a lawyer and, and be, be in these rooms faster. So I asked the Navy to apply and, and they said yes, and I got accepted. And, you know, now I'm planning on being a national security lawyer. So focusing on decision-making, law of war, uh, things, all the things that go with, um, you know, managing the lethal force that, that is the Navy. And, um, you know, that's, that's something that, as an attorney, I think, you know, is very much something I wanted to do. And as a national security, you know, expert and career and somebody in that profession, that's, that was my next career goal. So that's, that's really where I'm heading now. And, and as a JAG, that's, that's going to be my career focus. Okay. That, that's good to know. You, you were mentioning earlier that anyone can establish this in any major city or whatever type of city, and you need almost two roles. Do you have those roles or how are you going about that? We do have those roles. Um, they are, we're currently 1099 contractors. Well, in the operations side, it's my COO, Charlie McGovern, and uh, I am the CEO. Um, Charlie and I have actually been going to high school together since sixth grade. And we've been best friends since then, but you know, we're, we're running this together and we're piecing together a lot of things. We're acting as officers, we're acting as the operations assistant. And I mean, sometimes I'm in the food truck, you know, grilling meat too. Like it's just, we're, we're you know, it's bootstrapping, but we do have two people um, that are very interested in both the roles. And um, as we continue to, to gain funding and gain support and, and you know, use these trucks as a revenue stream, um, we do plan to hire here um, in the fall. And you know, we're gonna be managing a truck in the DMV area. So we're, we're looking for restaurant manager um, and maybe even food truck type people, um, preferably veterans to, to run the program. 
and also train the veterans in, in a way that they can be a culinary instructor. I mean, we have veterans who are classically trained chefs coming in for one or two times a month just to run the truck and give some instructional, you know, direction to the fellows in our program. But we really do need that full-time person who's, who's managing the truck and, um, you know, we'll be actively seeking that out here in the fall. Do you have a set schedule, Jordan, as far as when the truck is out there on the streets? We do. Um, we focus on weekends right now in the summer because I mentioned earlier that, you know, they're all working moms. So we work around their schedule, which is another element of our program that we believe is important. It, you know, we don't want to restrict anybody because of their lifestyle or schedule that they can't complete this. We can't, we don't want to say you have to be here Monday through Friday, nine to five, or else you can't do it. We're working with them. So our operational schedule is focused on the weekends, but when August comes around, we're actually going to be on a weekday and weekend schedule because we'll have more availability of people. And that's really when we're going to be operating. But like many food trucks, um, you know, you'll see them go in parking places and lines and like, you know, remember Farragut Square and all the way up to Union Station, you know, you see these, you know, a bunch of food trucks before the pandemic and, you know, they'd be lined up and you come out of your office building and go get them. We're actually more of an event-based model, and, and, the, and the reason for that is because like fraternal organizations, example, like um, you know, Chevrolet's American Legion that we partner with, or, or just like Annapolis Rotary, um, they will nine, time out, nine times out of ten want to select a chow food truck because of our mission, but we're also fighting, and we cook, I think, one of the best menus in the area, so not only that, like us being the best food truck in the county, um, that means 10 times out of 10 people are going to pick us. So we found that like catering and event-based models are actually where we're, we're getting most of our, our play. So we end up doing those mostly Friday, Saturday, Sundays. And, uh, you know, we found that the event base for the meantime is probably how we're going to operate. And it provides for the most consistent training value um, for, for our fellows too. That's great. Uh, what advice would you give someone who came to you just starting off, whether it is a new venture, it can be a nonprofit or for-profit business now knowing and going through this the past year and a half or two with child. Yeah, that's, that's always a tough one. Cause I think um, people kind of assume like when, when we're talking on pack house, like this is like, Oh, it seems like Chow has had nothing but success. And it's like, no, it's not true. It's a lot like my life, right? Like when I didn't get in the Naval Academy, when things like that, you know, when you get benched at a sport, like there, there are blips, there are down peaks, you know, that you, you don't talk about them cause they're not fun to talk about, but you know, it's been hard running chow and, and there have been, you know, ups and downs. And I would say, um, don't let those downs completely discourage you. If, if you truly believe in what you want to do, whatever the venture is, um, you're going to have failures. Um, use that and keep moving forward, but um, don't ever let just a single person or even several people tell you this is a bad idea or this is never going to work. Um, People told us you won't be able to start a nonprofit during a pandemic. You won't be able to start a nonprofit during law school. Um, you won't be able to rotate your menu because you won't be able to source effectively to make money. Um, you know, you, you won't be able to also pay the fellows to be in your system. You'll have to charge them tuition. We've listened to none of that and we've excelled to the point where we are now a six figure nonprofit. Don't charge a single dime in tuition and have one of the, most interesting menus um, as a food truck in Maryland right now because we rotate it. So um, always kind of trust your instincts, believe, believe, you know, take feedback, but if you believe in something, um, don't be discouraged. I love that. I just had a, a previous interview prior to this and he had seven, I believe, several businesses, some successful, some didn't, he had to shut down and close, you know, and he was saying how some of them, there are signs as far as, it, this is going to be a losing business. You can only try so much. And I, and I completely agree with you that you, you need to try to the end. But someone out there, is there, I'm sure you, you had setbacks with Chow and you had successes, but at a certain point, if it was more failures than successes, you probably would have been like, okay, or, or there are signs I'm sure you would have looked out for, correct? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, what? like when do you abandon ship, right? It's like, oh, is this, is this really not working? Um, do we have too much money tied up in one thing? Do we need the pivot? And I, I think the pivoting concept is, is, is interesting in entrepreneurship because it's like, well, you know, I think the most important thing when you reach these revelations is, well, if you made a mistake, you know, you own it, you pivot and you fix it. Those are the things you need to do. You need to do all three of those. And if there is a failure point after that, 
and you're continually going through this process and nothing is actually fixing, then maybe it is time to cut losses. But I wouldn't take, you know, a string of failures or something. Maybe what you're doing isn't right, but you always need to own the mistakes. And I think that's an important thing in this business and in entrepreneurship generally. Um, and figuring out um, who your customer actually is, you know, wh whatever it is for us, you know, we have multiple sets of customers, but who, what pain point are you trying to solve? All those typical things. But um, I, I do think that uh, when, when you, when you see failure, you got to figure out what the mistake was. You got to figure out how to pivot. You just got to figure out how to fix it. That's good. Uh, Jordan, is there any specific habits or skills that come to mind that you feel has personally helped you whether you personally or the business, not the business, the nonprofit. I mean, of course, when I say that. Yeah, personally skills, I think, um, well, for one, my COO is actually a professional videographer and photographer. So he, all the videos you see has been his journalism background has been able to spin a story. And I, I think that's important to note is like, he, he didn't come from like an MBA program or anything. He, he was a journalist uh, you know, he, he did, freelance videography for, for the local Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And like that has actually been one of the more valuable tools for us because we're spinning a story. It's, it's all part of, of this, you know, nonprofit, you know, getting donor money, telling a story. I think that's been something that's really important is for, for me, you know, with, with hidden skills and things that have really set this business up for success. We talked about time management. We talked about diligence. Like, yeah, th those are some intangibles that are important. Um, but I think we kind of get back to like this whole, like we talked about childhood. And I know the reason, you know, you do this is because you believe in family and childhood like I do is it shapes people really it does for the rest of their lives. And like, it goes back to me with that, that chip. Right. And it's like, well, I've kind of gotten over this of being told I can't do this and you're not good enough. And I've started to kind of, you know, focus a little more on improving people. Right. Like we talked about, but that whole chip still carries over for other people. Um, the fact that veterans, and military spouses struggle to start businesses in the culinary industry because that they're not sedentary for 20 years, because we've been in, in two conflicts for over 20 years and people don't have that amount of time to dedicate to developing entrepreneurial relationships in the culinary industry with food distributors and things like that. It shouldn't preclude them from starting a restaurant business. And, and that's, that's the thing too, is I think we've forgotten um, a lot about how tough service can be on people. I think we do a lot of good things and we do, you know, a lot of things maybe not right. Maybe nobody actually means to do harm, but, but it's not working. And for me, um, you know, this gets back to my chip is, Hey, you know, 10% off at home Depot isn't the only thing we should be doing for veterans, right? Like there should be a lot more engaging programs. And there are, there are some that work really well. Uh, but for Chow, as we kind of take this and say, you know, you might not have had a fair shot, but, you know, we're going to make sure that you're able to complete the American dream. And that shouldn't be precluded because you chose to serve the country. And um, more and more, we see that it's helping people because of, there's high fail rates in the restaurant industry, high startup costs. But with something like Chow, it, it props up, you know, the little guy, so to speak. And, and I think that's important. And that comes back to me feeling like I have this chip and something to prove. But it's more that I want to see the people who have been told you're never going to succeed actually succeed. So when you see a chow chef who's a James Beard award winner in 10 years, who just got a chance only through our program, then you can say like, wow, he, he was really right. Right. He wasn't this guy who's absolutely insane about just people telling him what he can and can't do. Like there, there's something to this and I hope that comes through, but um, that, I think that is probably the thing that drives us most is, is you know, helping people succeed when they told they can't. I love that. And, and I think it's totally cool, Jordan, as far as I have several clients in the restaurant business who has several restaurants or restaurant tours. And just the concept that you're doing, it's a great stepping stone. Um, a lot of them aspire to have their own physical restaurant location, but all the skills that you're teaching them is just invaluable. And we, we like to say, too, if you go through the program and uh, decide that, wow, food truck business was not what I liked and it was not for me. It's like, well, I'm glad we stopped you from buying a $60,000 food truck. You know, it's, um, <laughs> there, there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about figuring out what you don't want to do too. Um, but the regulatory environment's tough when you have non-native English speakers, it, it's even tougher uh, when there's a lack of resources within the counties. Uh, and, you know, we're here for that too. We're, we're here to, to give people a fair shot. We have a lot of overlapping demographics with immigrants, veterans, military spouses, uh, you know, formerly incarcerated and things like that. Just people who are 
coming to life um, after maybe stumbling a bit or just not having a fair shot or just some type of transition. And, and that's, that's really what we're here for uh, in the community. And we're able to provide a lot of services um, through a food truck too, which I think is always, I always like to highlight that. It's like, we talk about, we're doing a lot of things in the community and you, you think that there's something sophisticated behind it. And I think people don't think food trucks are sophisticated, but when you use them the right way, they, they truly are. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're using them for, for the good of the community, which is, which is pretty special. You know, for, for any business, the lifeblood is the top line, the revenue, the sales coming in. And for a nonprofit organization such as yourself is the donation, the donation money. How, how do you go about finding that, those donations? Yeah, the donations really, they, they, they come through outreach. So, so really there, there's a, there's a rule called the six point of contact rule on some type, some nonprofit theory type classes you'll hear, but really they say it takes about six points of contact with a donor before somebody will give you money. So you need to like show up on their Instagram feed, have them come to your website. Maybe they even interact with your food truck. And then at some point they see you're doing good and then they'll give you their hard earned cash. And that's like an individual donor. Um, then there's foundations, there's grants. Um, those are all revenue streams to corporations as well. Um, those are all revenue streams for Chow. And um, if the truck itself was just solely this schoolhouse and constantly giving out meals, we would, we would definitely need to supplement more from grants and donations for the truck. But the truck, which operates as a food truck, becomes a revenue stream on occasion when we're, when we're not doing charity you know, events. Mm -hmm. um, it actually does break even, if not do better for the truck. And by the way, that counts all the labor costs that go into it because we're paying the fellows to be in the program. So the way we have found it is by telling donors and, and you know, mostly with donor outreach is when you give money to an organization, you want to see it go to something. Um, it's the same reason, you know, Charity Water is a, is a big charity in, um, they're stationed, based out of New York, but they build wells in Africa and they've done a hundred percent model. Um, and they say hundred percent of your money goes to building a well and they'll even show you the well that your money helped build. So it gives donor attachment. We do the same thing with meals and food and events, and we do something called pay it forward. Uh, and we say it takes $4 for us to produce a hot restaurant quality style meal for somebody in need. need. So when somebody comes to our truck, you know, rather than asking for a tip, we ask if they'd like to pay it forward. And if they add $4 to their meal, they just bought a meal for somebody in need. And that has been really the best way to reach donors is show them that their money is going directly to something very much like that 100% model Charity Water did we're doing something similar saying, hey, our truck revenue stream is running itself. 100% of your money is going towards programming, not overhead, not any of this other stuff. It's going to the community and donors like to see that and they like to see us being a good steward of their money. And that's that's really, that success has beget success in many ways. So that's really how the outreach has, has happened from the start. That's a great idea with the pay it forward program. Was that, was that your idea? Yeah, it was, you know, we were, we were thinking like, you know, what, what can we do? Like, you know, what is it, well, what does it cost? That was the first question. What does it actually cost for meals? And like them being restaurant quality style with the fuel and everything, it costs about four, four dollars and 33 cents for us to produce each one of these meals. Like they're, they're big meals. They're not, you know, they're, they're not like your typical $1 meals that some organizations count as one meal. These are, these are hefty. So, okay, that was it. And then it's like, well, how do we alert people that they can do this? And it's like, well, I love the saying, pay it forward. And I think it would really catch on. And like, you know, people usually give similar amount and tips for some reason. It's like, well, let's, let's make sure they know this is actually going to another meal. And, you know, there's the Tom's model, buy one, get one for someone. I think, I think it all kind of came together where we're like, oh, here we go. And now we, we even have these, uh, I'll grab one for you, these challenge coins, you know, cause it's, it's so important in the military to have these coins. It's like, you know, this is your, your command, or this is from the Pentagon. This is from the Admiral. But like our challenge coins say, you know, pay it forward on, on the back you know, and chow on the front. So when somebody does come, they can buy one of these for $16 and then they just bought four meals uh, for somebody in need. So that's, that's another thing is like, okay, I have this paid forward coin. That's a cool memory, but I also just bought four meals um, probably for a family who really does need it. I like that. You're, you're, you're doing a great job with the marketing too. Is that all you as well? I mean, it's, it's me and Charlie, like it's, it's bootstrapping. Like we, we, we will love when we can hire full-time employees, um, but a year and a half old nonprofit, um, like we've had a lot of success, but um, we're just sitting and brainstorming and we're passionate and we're just coming up with things. And uh, 
you know, we, we really, we have a great third party marketing team, which is another high school connection, which is a girl I went to high school with since, since uh, sixth grade too. And they own uh, Bel Air branding out in LA and she's been, you know, helping us figure things out. She's, you know, USC trained, UCLA trained, and she knows marketing. And, you know, we just have this like great network of almost family in a way where it's like, you know, these people have seen me as a sixth grader, like dancing at a bar mitzvah or something. And like, I know Jordan in many different ways, not just from Chow. And I think, I think it really does build into the creativity because we can, we can freely bounce ideas off of each other. So these have all kind of just come from us working together, but having a good working relationship that existed years before Chow. That's great. <laughs> what would you say is your biggest challenge now with your role at Chow? My biggest challenge is, um, so I'm, I'm wearing a lot of hats and it's the bootstrapping thing. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, I, I, you know, I need to go back to Pittsburgh for weddings this summer and things like that. And it's like, I don't want the truck to not operate that day. I don't want people to not get meals because I'm not there to start up the system. So my biggest challenge is training people up to independently operate. And, um, that's kind of my big, my big call too, is like, you know, if you're a chef and you, you at least, know how your way around, you know, a little bit of a food trucker, I can teach you. We always need good people to just come and operate. Like we source the food. We have the fellows there. They're looking for good training. Um, if you're in the culinary business and you just want to step into our truck one day and just help the community um, and help some veterans and military spouses learn about the industry, um, we could always use that. Like, you know, me flipping chicken on a griddle doesn't help anybody. Like I need to be out there doing the CEO things, but there's something to be said and this is a Western Pennsylvania thing too, about rolling up your sleeves and just getting in there in the blue collar nature that is the food truck. And uh, I love it, but um, you know, I don't wanna be the limiting factor anymore. I, I need to start training people. And that's the toughest thing. It's not an easy system to learn. The food truck is hard um, and it's, it takes a while and it, it's a challenge in and of itself and sourcing food and serving customers. It's also difficult. I have so much respect for the food industry, you know, even before the pandemic, but, but now, um, you know, after seeing it, like, it's a hard job and, um, you know, finding somebody to be there and me not being the single point of operational failure is the biggest challenge. Have you found that person, Jordan, to help sort of replace you on the day to day with that role? We have. I mean, uh, they're in the system. They help us. And we have a couple other veteran chefs in the area who, who help us out too. The biggest next step here is carving out salaries now. Um, you know, we've, we've developed an operational budget at this point, and now it's time to ask foundations and ask for grants for salaries. And this is, you know, this is one of the things where, you know, sometimes we talked about, you know, donor outreach being like pay it forward, you know, buy a meal. That's great for individual donations. It, it's harder to go and say, well, hey, we need X thousand dollars to salary this employee. It's not a fun thing to ask for, but that's why grants and foundations exist is because we need to salary officers. We need to have people there to operate full time. And, you know, that's our biggest next step is asking for this funding and finding it and, and really bringing people on. But as far as people identified, like we have people we trust and believe in the system and we're also going to recruit and try to find more people. We're going to add a truck a year. There's going to be opportunities and uh, we want to find the right people who, um, actually believe in the mission over all things. And that's, that's our biggest criteria is that, you know, you believe first in serving the veterans, military spouses in the community before you do just operating it like a food truck, like a for-profit truck, like, because we talked about this, it's, it's so much more and we're seeing it every day. We're seeing how this is more than just, you know, a, a 18 foot mobile kitchen. This is, this is something that's it's a lot different than that. It's, it's a community builder. I agree. I think it all first starts with that mission. 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you know now, Jordan, that you wish you would have known at the start of your career? Hmm. Start of Chow, I wish I would have known how hard it is to raise capital. It, 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 is, it is very, very challenging. Um, when you don't have like your own financial backing or, or family and friends that can really like substantially support the startup phase, um, it is an absolute grind and you are sometimes relying on competitions. Sometimes you're competing like we were against 40 teams for in Georgetown for a thousand dollars and you win and you're like, wow, that was amazing. We beat 40 teams. Thousand dollars is a lot of money. We can do a lot of good with that. But like that was a grind to get that. And it's like, you just get up the next day and keep grinding at it. So I, I think if I would have known how hard it is initially to raise capital, it might've actually deterred me. I don't think it would have completely stopped me, but like, 
that is eye opening. And, and I and I really do say that from just not a nonprofit perspective, but I'm sure a for profit perspective too. Like that that initial phase is you really got to believe in what you're doing because you're going to get into a lot of rooms and they can sniff it out when you're not fully invested. And you know, for us, thankfully, like I had a lot of motivating factors, and uh, you know, we, we really we really went from there. But uh, raising capital is very challenging. Knowing now and knowing the importance of raising the capital, what would you have done differently? Or I guess maybe prepared yourself in a different manner. Yeah, I think with what we would have done differently is, you know, we, knowing it was going to be a long haul, knowing it was going to be hard is I think what we would have done is probably put more money of our own money up front. And I think like it, one, it's hard is one thing, like it can be hard, but you know, you can still accomplish it. And I think we would have been able to accomplish it, but we didn't have the confidence in Chow to actually put our own financial like thing up there. We, we are, mm-hmm. I should have put, you know, my own money up there, bought the truck immediately. I should have just bought a food truck. And I was like, I just don't know, like, this is also, you know, COVID, I'm not going to let myself completely off the hook, but like, things were weird in March 2020. And they only got weirder and weirder. And like, food trucks seem to kind of skirt these lines, but then sometimes they didn't, but we weren't ready to invest in that. But like, now knowing what we know with the way food trucks operated in COVID, um, I would have went back and bought the truck, which is the centerpiece of the program immediately. And then we would have went from there, rather than spending the year it took to raise the money for the truck. At a bare minimum, a truck, what you have now, how much would have been the, the investment? Usually, uh, so usually trucks are used vehicles, um, but brand new interiors. And you're looking at like, say like a 2001 Chevy Escort type thing with like 160,000 miles and a fully redone kitchen. Minimum is going to be 35, 40,000. Mm-hmm. That's not including the insurance. That's not including the vehicle wrap. Like if you want to get it painted at all, that's like 5,000 actually for a good paint job. Um, and then, you know, from that, you, you have so much, so many more fuel costs and things that go along with it. So we, we say that all in for a quality truck is 60,000. That, that's that's uh-huh. what it actually takes. Um, and, and, you know, that's, there's not a lot of ways of getting around that. The more you try to skirt that, there's more of a get what you pay for. And there are ways that some builders can really preclude you from doing business because they're not following regulations. And you could buy a $30,000 truck and not be able to operate in a single county in Maryland because the vent hood is on the side of the truck. And that's just the builder's reason for doing that is whatever, but you just have to be really sure that what you're purchasing, purchasing is serviceable too. So just buying the truck is even only the first step. Hey, but I get it. You know what? Sixty thousand dollar investment, especially in a pandemic, a global pandemic, that put us all in a recession. That's not yes. It's not that easy to pull the trigger on that. Yeah, I mean, knowing what I know, I wish I would have. But um, raising the money, doing it the right way, being a good steward of donor money, and uh, you know, operating pop up stands like we had a tailgate grill, um, and then we had service space behind us, and we had a, a little you know ice cooler. We just simulated the inside of a truck and we would do these pop-ups at different places and like all right well we don't need a truck right now it'll be great later but going from that like pop-up stand and serving customers and delivering meals to like going to the truck to me I always equate this to like like a momentum shift in football when it's like you feel like the opponent's just like you know running down your throat like six yard carry ten yard carry I can't stop them then there's this time when like all right we get an interception then we're marching down the field and it's like once we got the truck, it was like, oh, we got the interception. We're marching down the field. We're controlling the game now. And that was huge to us. So it made me appreciate, you know, the truck more by starting out the way we did. Yeah. Jordan, when I say the word success, what is the first thing you think of? I mean, helping others for us, like creating business owners. That's what, that's success to us. Um, if, if, you know, years from now, if we can look at these four that are in our program right now and identify their four individual food trucks and how it's changed their lives and how it's starting them as entrepreneurs, that that's success. And, um, you know, that's, that's what I want to see. And, and that's what we will see. That's, that's what this program is built to do. And that's the biggest thing, because once you highlight their story too, and success begets success, and then there's a snowball effect right there. Exactly. You know, we have so much interest in the program from veterans and military spouses, but right now it's only if you're located in the DMV to do this program, this only program that exists like this in the nation, you have to be at the DMV. Well, like let's scale, let's expand, let's, let's get more people opportunities. Um, 
but yeah, like once we, once we start seeing viability, not only from our own program, like we mentioned, but from people who graduate from our program, then that's, I think that's really when this is, this is going to catch on. And I think we're seeing that the military spouse income as a secondary income that's also mobile and moves with them as the mobile food industry does um, is huge. And then the veteran transitioning to being your own boss, serving the community, which will lead to brick and mortar for, for many, many, many food trucks, you know, became brick and mortars later. And we think like, that's a really beautiful progression in the industry too. And, um, you know, every day we're kind of, we're fighting for the success of others. And, uh, you know, we're, we're doing that through the resources we provide. Jordan, I'm sure you had some great mentors along your journey. Is there one or a, a two people that you can think of and what you learn from them? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think law school really caused me to sit back and, and really look at some, you know, allow people to, to mentor me. Georgetown has incredible amount of professors, but um, so I had one professor in, in a clinic. It's like a hands-on, um, you know, legal, you know, you work with clients. It's not like a class. It's not just books. Um, and, 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 you know, Alvaro Bedoya was my clinic director and he, you know, worked on the Hill for years brilliant attorney um, and just really showed me, um, you know, he started his own nonprofit too, but he really showed me how to be an advocate, really showed me how to care for people and really showed me how to be client centric. And uh, his mentorship really led to a lot of things. He was probably one of the first people I told about the idea of child. This is before we were an illegal entity. And, um, you know, a lot of his leadership and mentorship and the way he carried himself was something I brought to the organization. And, I think as far as child goes, you know, he was, he was one of our greatest mentors, you know, as, as he goes, we have so many people helping us, but the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Center, along with Alvaro, um, you know, being at the law center have been just so valuable. So university systems, you know, have, have really been the best things for us to lean on. That's great. So what does the future or the next five years look for you and child? Yeah, for us, uh, a truck a year. So we're going to add a truck to the fleet every year, and we plan to expand to Northern Virginia here in the next year. We also plan to have a truck up in Baltimore. So we're going to expand that model. That one, two, three model is, is going to be happening. Um, within the DMV, we're giving us some leeway. We want to have actually a few more trucks, but then um, a next area for growth we're actually looking at is, is Oklahoma. Um, we're, we're looking at Oklahoma City as a, as a town that meets a lot of different um, you know, qualities we're looking for, proximity to bases, high veteran population, um, favorable mobile food industry laws. And uh, we're looking to start the one, two, three model in Oklahoma City and um, see how that goes. So in five years, um, we like to think that we're going to have two to three separate locations um, for Chow and uh, have multiple employees. And, um, you know, at that point, we're, we're putting uh, anywhere from 30 to um, 100 veterans and military spouses into the workforce um, as business owners, as entrepreneurs. So um, that's, that's whenever I think, you know, we can really sit back and say like, this is what we always wanted to be. And this is the growth we wanted to see, but we're not scaling too fast. Um, we're scaling at our pace because when I did my research, uh, you know, I was looking at nonprofits, there were a lot of nonprofits that got caught for being fraudulent and, you know, to veterans, maybe even some for-profit organizations being predatory to veterans. And, um, I guarantee you they didn't start and incorporate and say, we're actually going to defraud veterans. They, it happened because they scaled too fast. Um, they, they, they lost their morals. Um, if we scale too fast and we start charging tuition, that's against our morals. We don't want to charge tuition. So it's scaling at our pace. So that may not seem like a grand plan for five years, um, but that is the pace that we need to go to maintain every value set we have. I love that. Last question, Jordan. Uh, and I know you don't have much of free time, but in your free time, what do you like to do for fun? <laughs> that is, um, that, that it used to be golfing for now, but um, actually now, now it's, uh, the free time has been uh, consumed a lot actually with um, developing new recipes. So I've been uh, really getting more back into the creative space. So I'm finishing up a culinary degree too at the community college and I'm, uh, I'm starting to just craft menu items and, and and I think like it's really fun to kind of you know try new things and test them out on really it's my only my wife who eats it my, my daughter eats chicken nuggets and, and cheese it's that's about it but um you know I, I think the the whole like testing the limits of my culinary boundaries have been really helpful for me cre as a creative mind but also um you know I I own a a culinary business now this is you know that's I, I think it's I owe it to to all the people I train and myself to keep fresh in the kitchen so you know I'm cooking because we need to eat but also um, 
I'm making things like, you know, steamed pork buns and things that, you know, you typically don't see on a daily, you know, dinner basis. So I think that's, that's been my, my biggest use of time over the pandemic is creating, you know, restaurant type meals for the family because we haven't been going out too much. Um, and, and that's been, that's been really fun and, and productive for me too. That's great. Yeah. Jordan, if people want to learn more about you or Chow or may want to donate, where can they go to? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, right now, I'll just go on letschow.org. That's www.letschow.org. And you can click the donate tab and donate. Um, we always, you know, ask that you, you, you pay it forward. If, if, you know, if you didn't get your cup of coffee today and you, you, know, you just want to donate $4 and that will buy a hot meal for somebody in need. If you can donate more, um, that money does go towards training our veterans and military spouses and, you know, them completing the program. So we thank you for, for any amount. Um, but we also, we, we've understood this from the start, that this is a tough time for everybody financially. Um, so we, if you can't donate, we actually ask, um, we call it Challenge 22, uh, and we ask you to tell 22 of your closest contacts about Chow. So share us on social media, send 22 people an email with our website and explain what we do. And that number symbolizes the 22 veterans who die by suicide every day and Chow's dedication to bringing that number down. Um, so if you can donate, we thank you very much uh, for that. And it will go towards programming meals for people to our veterans. Uh, but if you can't, we ask you to share us with 22 of your closest contacts and um, that, you know, and follow us on social media, but please go to letschow.org and um, all our social handles are there and our donate tab. But, um, you know, thank you and please follow us because then you'll know where we're serving our food right now is our Latin American street food menu. And I know nobody wants to miss that one in the summer. So just keep following us and uh, please come out to Anne Arundel County or we'll be at Chevrolet here in next week. But uh, please, uh, you know, follow us and, and thank you again for your support. Jordan, thank you so much for coming on and for everything you're doing. It's amazing work. Thank you, Otto. I mean, this is great. I'm, I get to now be in the podcast rather than listening to it, which is super cool. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. This was really great string of questioning. And just, you know, I, I think um, it's important to do this um, with all the DMV entrepreneurs in the area. I think I, I learned so much from people by listening to these. Uh, I hope somebody learned a couple of things or one thing from me, uh, but, but please reach out to us. Our contact information is on there. And um, I'm happy to talk to anybody about Chow or just, you know, offer any advice and, you know, I'll pay it forward in, in the way that people, you know, asked me, you know, I asked people how to start a business, how to start a nonprofit. I'm here for anybody who, who's thinking about it too. So, you know, please go online and find our contact info and email me because I'll, I'll get all those emails. Like I told you, I, I wear a lot of hats. I get the info emails. I get all of them. So that's me. Awesome. Thank you again, Jordan. Thanks, Otto. Appreciate it. See you, man. See ya.